Would you place us all stand for just a moment as we reverence the reading of God's Word. Psalms 24. I won't keep you long this morning. We'll be out before 2 o'clock for sure. That was a joke. Amen. No, we've got Easter dinner right after church, so I may preach five minutes. We'll just go eat. Amen. No. All right, Psalms chapter 24. I uh, was studying this this week, and uh, this is the passage that Mark Wheeler preached on. If you remember, at the youth meeting, he preached on this and uh, did a phenomenal job. And man, I love this passage so much, I figured that this would be a great Easter passage. So I want you to notice Psalms chapter 24, only 10 verses. Let's read the whole psalm. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands, a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Notice verse number 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Amen. Who is this King of glory? Oh my, I like the answer in verse 8. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. That word Selah means to go back and just think upon what you just read. I want to preach to you. I want to draw your attention back there to verse number 7, 8, 9, and 10 where the Bible says to lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. Two times it mentions that in verse number 7 and in verse number 9. And it says to lift up and the King of glory shall come in. I want to preach this message this morning entitled, Lift Up Your Heads, The King Is Coming In. Amen? Lift up your heads, the King is coming in. Let's pray quickly and we'll get into the message. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church. God, we are always glad that you rose from the dead. But, Lord, this Sunday out of all the other Sundays in the year, we just put a little bit of a more special emphasis on the fact that you got up out of the grave victorious over death, hell, and the tomb. So, Lord, I pray now that you'd help me. I cannot do this without you. I cannot preach without your help. And, Lord, I don't know if there's somebody here this morning that maybe they're not saved. Maybe if they were to die tonight, they'd go to hell and burn forever. But, God, you... You died on the cross and paid for their sins and rose again from the dead so they wouldn't have to. So, Lord, I pray that nobody would leave here this morning without getting it settled in their heart where they're spending eternity. God, I pray if there's a Christian that's weary and downtrodden, maybe discouraged and depressed, Father, that you would encourage them through the Word and lift them up this morning. God, I pray that you help me now as I preach in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning. Now, I want you to notice here, Psalms 24. This is what we would call a messianic psalm. That means that this is a psalm that's making some prophecies about Jesus Christ. We understand that Jesus Christ one day is going to come back and set up a kingdom on earth and He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. But I want you to notice something here. As I was looking at these verses, I started thinking about some gates uh, uh, in the Bible. Now, the Bible, or excuse me, uh, the old saying is, is fences make what? Anybody know the old saying? Fences make good what? Neighbors, amen. A good fence makes a good neighbor. And uh, gates are there. You think about, you go up to Washington, D.C. I've been up to Washington, D.C. And you've got the White House there. And guess what they've got completely surrounding the White House? They've got a gate. And uh, unless you want to have a bad day, you don't cross that gate, amen. Uh, you go up to Buckingham. I've been to Buckingham Palace in England. And it's interesting there, uh, they've got the wall and the gate completely uh, around Buckingham Palace but they've got big openings where anybody could just walk in. But they've got a line, a white line that says, Do not cross the line. And uh, if you cross that line, you've got some of the royal guards there. You're going to have a bad day, okay? Uh, so gates are there to keep things out 
Or gates are also there to keep some things in. Uh, I remember my wife, her pastor uh, growing up, had a son that was completely deaf. He was deaf, could not hear anything. He had some mental delays, and so they wanted him to be able to go outside and play without having to worry about him maybe walking out in front of a car and getting hit or something like that. So I remember they put up a fence all the way around their property line so that he could stay inside the gate and not be in any danger of wandering outside. So gates are there maybe to keep things out or to keep some things in. And so I started thinking about the gates in the Bible and what exactly the gates had to do with Jesus Christ. Once, of course, Easter Sunday, right? We understand that we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I started thinking about the gates. Uh, When did Jesus Christ go through some gates? I'm sure in His ministry, Jesus Christ went through some gates. But I started thinking about specifically what gates specifically dealt with the fact that Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again. Because that's the gospel, right? Amen. The, the gospel that we preach, the power of the gospel, the thing that will save your never dying soul is the fact that Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again, right? And that's what I'm trusting in to get me to heaven. I'm not trusting my good works. I'm not trusting my church membership. I'm not trusting the fact that I can do all these religious activities. But I'm trusting the fact that Jesus died for my sin, He was buried, and He rose again. Amen. Now stay with me here. When Jesus Christ is hanging there on the cross, He hung there for six hours. He made an eternal payment for your sin in six short hours. And He's hanging there dying. And the Bible says that He said, Father, into Thy hands do I commend my spirit. He says there as He's hanging on the cross, He makes a final cry. He had paid for sin. you got to understand this morning, I think sometimes we fail to realize Jesus Christ had the sin of the whole world on His back. The Bible says that the Lord had laid upon Him the iniquity of us all. I want you to take the most perverted, disgusting, evil thought you've ever had, and that's what God put on Jesus Christ. I want you to think of the most vile, disgusting, perverted act that could ever happen to a man. Uh, You think of serial killers like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer and all the sick actions and all the sick things they did. You understand, hear me this morning, Jesus Christ took all those sins on Himself. And if Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy would have ever cried out to God and said, Lord, forgive me, I'm a poor, rotten sinner, and I want you to save me, Jesus Christ would look down them and say, that's good, son. I paid for those sins. Amen. But you've got to understand, every sick, twisted sin that's ever been committed, that's what Christ was bearing on the cross that day he died. And as he's hanging there in agony, he's paying for the sin of the world. One of the final statements he ever makes is he looks up, now look, it looks pretty weak. If you're a disciple, imagine being Peter or James or John that day. And here's the man you've been following for three and a half years. The man that you have literally given up your family, your houses, your occupation, everything that you are, you've given it up in order to follow this man around the desert of Judea for three and a half years. And you think, man, this is the guy. As we talked about last Sunday, they thought he was going to set up the kingdom then. They thought, man, this is a man who's going to deliver us from the Romans. He's going to overthrow the Roman Empire. This is the guy that's going to bring in the kingdom to Israel. We have found Messiah. And all of a sudden now, you walk in and you look up at Calvary, and he's hanging there, naked as a jaybird, not a stitch of clothing on him, hanging there, beaten in blood. The Bible says his visage was marred more than any man. They beat him so badly, you couldn't hardly tell it was a man. You walk by the three crosses, you'd say there's a man on that side, there's a man on that side, but what's that piece of meat hanging in the middle? That's how bad they beat him. Uh, Josephus, Jewish historian, says that most people didn't even survive the beatings that the Roman guards would give the people. They would rip those convicts and they would uh, literally, literally peel the skin and flesh off their backs when they whipped them with that cat and nine tails. And he's hanging there in utter agony. And these disciples are looking up and saying, could this be the 
the man that said he was going to bring in the kingdom of Israel? Could this be the man that just one week ago was doing miracles and healing the lame and uh, raising up the dead? Is this the guy? And as he's hanging there in utter agony and seemingly utter defeat, you know what he cries out? This is interesting. You know what he cries out? Not, it's not the last thing he said, but the second the last thing he said on the cross. See, on the cross, you're dying by asphyxiation. The way they did that thing is you had to push up. See, they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet. And you had to push up on those nails in order to get a breath. You had to push up. And I mean, can you imagine having to push up on a nail that was driven through your feet just to be able to get a breath? That's how you had to breathe on the cross because it would asphyxiate you. And so there one last time, as everything looks hopeless, all of a sudden Jesus pushes up one last time. And this is what he says. He says... It is finished. Now, if you study that phrase, it is finished, in those days, it was not just something like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with supper. Or no, it wasn't some kind of cry like, hey, I'm finished with this project. That was a battle cry. That was a cry associated at the end of a battle when a king would win or when a king would declare victory in a battle or in a war. He would go up and declare, it is finished. Finished. And what you got to understand this morning is when Jesus Christ was on the cross, He was fighting a battle with the devil. And He was fighting a battle with all the principalities and the powers and all those secret things that we can't see because they're in the spirit world. As Jesus Christ is dying on the cross, every devil in hell is fighting against Him. And I think it's interesting that right here in our text, the Bible says in verse number 8, Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty. Mighty in where? Battle. What you got to understand is Jesus Christ is fighting every devil in hell while He's on the cross in order to pay for your sin. So now notice, I, I, I'm setting myself up here. All of a sudden He lets out a victory cry. And I'm sure everybody sitting there is thinking... I mean, can you imagine being the Roman soldiers that day? You've crucified thousands of people before. And they're sitting there dying. And all of a sudden you've got this guy... And he's dying. And all of a sudden, right before he dies, he lets out a victory screech. It kind of, you know, back, back in the Civil War when the, when the Confederates would go out and you had the rebel call. Or something like that, you know. Indians, you know, they, they would win a battle and, you know, they'd do all their crazy stuff, whatever they did. Can you imagine right before a man dies, he's sitting there naked as a jaybird, hanging on the cross, literally organs hanging out of his body from where they just beat him to death. His eyes probably beaten almost to the point where they're shut. Blood mangled, a crown of thorns on his head, hanging there on the cross. And all of a sudden, he lets out a victory cry. Mm -hmm. What in the world is he doing? See, they didn't understand that day that Jesus Christ has just won one of the greatest battles in ever In fact, he won the greatest battle that could ever be fought. He, the Bible says, see, the Bible says in Hebrews 2 that before Jesus died, the devil had the power over death. It was the devil that was reigning. Death reigned from Moses uh, all the way up. They were under the law. But understand now, Jesus there, as the Bible says, he tasted death for every man. Yeah. Jesus Christ, everybody else thought that his death was some kind of defeat. Oh, no, no, no. The devil knew, the devil knew that if Jesus died, he could raise up again. Amen. The devil knew. Listen, the devil knew that Jesus Christ could get himself back up. And so he dies, he lets out a victory tree. And now we find the first gate he walked through. The Bible talks about Ecclesiastes 9 and 2 Samuel 26. It talks about the first gate. It talks about the gates of death. It talks about the gates of death. Now I want you to imagine now for Two, or excuse me, for 4,000 years of human history, death had been claiming lives. 4,000 years. Death had claimed this one and death had claimed that one. Ever since Abel, remember Cain killed Abel? Ever since Abel had been killed by his brother Cain, death had been coming and claiming people. All right, we often see like the Grim Reaper or somebody with a little, you know, dressed in a long robe and got the little, you know, sickle in his hand. That's not probably not what death looks like, but you get in the image. When somebody's ready to die, the death angel comes. And he says, it's time for you to go. And he reaps that soul. Understand, for 4,000 years that had been happening. For 4,000 years, death had been leading people through the gates of death as people would slip out into eternity. But all of a sudden, 2,000 years ago, on this day, 
Stay with me now. Somebody see me right here. This man was a little bit different than any other yes. man that had ever come through the gates of death. And there was something a little bit different about this man. Because death is always seen as something that is bad. Listen, I've often said that death never comes at a convenient time, right? I mean, there's never a convenient time to die. A funeral never happens at a convenient time. Even when your loved one is in pain and agony and you know that they'd be better off just going on to heaven, it's still hard when they die, isn't it, right? I mean, death is something painful. Death is something that nobody likes. And for 4,000 years, death, the angel of death, had just been doing his job reaping the soul. But all of a sudden, as the angel of death is leading Jesus Christ, through the gates of death, all of a sudden somebody cries out, Oh, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lift up the everlasting door, because the King of glory is coming in. And all of a sudden the King of glory walks in through the gates of death, and he says, Be ye lift up, O ye gates. Yes. The devil doesn't have control over this anymore. The devil... The devil's not in charge here anymore. Be ye lift up, O ye gates. The King of glory is coming in. Well, who is this King of glory? Man, it's the King of glory that's mighty and strong in battle. He just fought the, he just fought the devil on the cross and paid for the sin of the world. And he's coming in. Be ye lift up, O ye gates. Amen. Amen. All of a sudden... Jesus Christ, now we don't have time to get into all the theological implications, but we understand that Jesus Christ dumped our sins where? He dumped our sins into hell, right? Our sins got dumped into hell. The Bible says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. And I believe Jesus Christ went to hell, and uh, I believe He paid for some sin there, and dumped our sins there in hell. But now we notice Jesus Christ said, remember before He died in Matthew 16, Jesus said, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there's Jesus Christ. He just came in through the gates of death. And he said, Be ye lift up, O ye gates, and lift up your heads, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And then he's in there for three days and three nights. Uh, he's there in the heart of the earth in paradise. People before Jesus Christ died, Old Testament saints, they went to paradise. They didn't go to heaven because nobody goes to heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ, right? So before Jesus died, those Old Testament saints went to the paradise part. There were two parts of the center of the earth. There was hell and there was paradise. That's why the rich man in Luke 16 could see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom and the poor man could see the rich man burning in hell, Luke 16. That's what happened before Jesus Christ died on the cross. But as he's in there, stay with me now, as he's in there in the heart of the earth, sitting around in paradise with all these Old Testament saints, you know, Abraham said, Lord, is that you? I, I rejoice to see your day. Moses said, is that Jesus Christ? Is this the Messiah? All the Old Testament prophets are there. And in comes through the gates of death. In comes their Messiah. He says, wait a second, boys. I've got to dump everybody's sins in hell. I'll be right back. Hang on just a second. Let me dump everybody's sins in hell. And he goes over to the other side. And he dumps all their sins into hell. Now say, with me here. Do you know why that's such a miracle? Do you remember Luke 16? We just talked about it, where Abraham and the poor man Lazarus are in paradise, and they look over and they see the rich man burning in hell. Right. And they're having a conversation, right? right? But Abraham says, between us and you, there is what? A great gulf fixed, so that people that are here could not go over there. Now, why in the world would anybody in paradise want to go over to hell? Because they see their loved ones over there. They want to save them out of the fire. And then obviously we understand why people in hell would want to go to paradise, right? No, that's a no-brainer. Stay with me. It's about to get good. And so there was a great gulf that was fixed to where nobody could pass over. Nobody had ever, ever been here and then gone to here. And nobody had ever been here and gone to there. But Jesus Christ, when he died... He dumped our sins in hell. And so as he goes through the gates of death, he says, wait a second, death. I know I'm going to paradise, uh, but I'm going to take a detour real quick into hell and dump their sins in hell real quick. I'm going to make a drop off in hell. And so he goes and he's over there in hell and he's dropping off our sins. Uh, and now stay with me here. And now as the payment for sin has been made and he dumps our sins in hell, 
He now does what no man had ever done before. The gates of hell for 4,000 years had been closed and everybody that's ever gone there has never gotten out. And everybody after Jesus Christ, if they go there, they'll never get out. There was only one man who ever went to hell. And then he says, all right, I'm done here. I've got to get over there to paradise and get all those Old Testament saints and bring them up to heaven with me. Do you know what he does? He looks at the gates of hell and he says, uh, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Amen? And he gets up out of hell and he walks over across the paradise and all of a sudden all those old Testament saints are looking and they say, my God, nobody's ever done that. Uh, the, the only one other guy that's ever done that was Jonas. Remember, Jonas died and went to Jonah. And the Bible says that the sign that was given them was the sign of the who? The prophet Jonah, right? My God, he just crossed over from hell into paradise. And Jesus Christ comes in there and he says, here I am. I'm the one. Everybody get ready. I know you guys have been here for a long time. Abel, you've been here for 4,000 years. But don't worry, we're out here in three days. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And then all of a sudden, uh, we see at the end of those three days and three nights, uh, Jesus has been laying there. And he said, all right, boys, it's time to get out. It's time to go. And then we see the third set of gates that he walks through. The Bible talks about the bars and the gates of the earth. I don't have time to get into all the theological implications, but there's some things going on under the surface of the earth. Oh, yeah. There's some things and some places that I don't want to get it all up on the Easter Sunday morning. We want to kind of keep it light this morning. But there's some things going on underneath our earth oh, yeah. that, uh, that uh, you, you probably stay up at night and thinking about, okay? Yeah. That, our, that our government probably knows about too. But anyway, we ain't going to get it all that this morning. Stay with me though. But Jesus Christ has been there in the heart of the earth. The bars and the gates of the earth have been around him. He is in a tomb, a tomb that no man had ever laid in, right? I think it's interesting when Jesus Christ came into this world, he came into this world in a womb that a man had never been in. He was virgin born. And when he left this world, he left out of here in a tomb that no man had ever been in. Right. Amen. Amen. You can pay that one for free. You can shout on that one a little bit. Now watch it. A sealed womb couldn't keep him out, and a sealed tomb couldn't keep him in. Amen. Amen. Now stay with me here. You ready? So he says, all right, boys. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Elijah, all you Old Testament saints, Rahab, Amen, Deborah, everybody get ready. What are you talking about getting ready? We're out of here. What do you mean we're out of here? Just get ready. Because see, the Bible says that when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, there were also many other saints that rose with him. Right? Yep. right? Yep. Get ready, boys. We're out of here. And all of a sudden, 4,000 years, nobody had ever, ever gotten out. Uh, had nobody had, listen, people had been raised from the dead before, right? Elijah raised some people from the dead. Elias, or, uh, Elisha raised some people from the dead. But Jesus Christ was unique because there wasn't somebody standing over him. See, everybody else that had been raised from the dead, there was somebody else standing over them saying, come back to life, amen? Right. There wasn't anybody ever standing over Jesus right. Christ. Right. Right. Yeah. Nobody had to raise him from the dead. He raised himself up. Amen. Amen. All of a sudden, this man, he says, all right, get ready, boys. We're going through those gates. But Lord, that's the gates of the earth. That's the gates of, that's the gates of, that's the bars and gates of the earth. Nobody's ever gotten out of the tomb by themselves. Nobody's ever raised up by their own power. This can't happen. No, no, get ready. Here we go. And Jesus marches up and he says, Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And he walks in through there, and all of a sudden on Saturday night, sometime between sundown and sunrise on Sunday morning, Jesus Christ got out of the tomb, and he rose from the dead. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, hang on a second. For most people, that's where the story would end. Oh, but we got to dig a little deeper than that. I'm enjoying myself preaching this morning. <laughs> Stay with me now. Jesus Christ raises from the dead, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Amen. The Bible says he had the keys. And when he look, when John sees him, he says, I've got the keys of death and hell. I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive, and I am alive forevermore. Amen. Yeah. 
I wonder if sometimes the Lord just doesn't dangle the keys in front of the devil every now and then and just remind him of what he's got. Now wait a second, we're almost done here. Stay with me now. All of a sudden now, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. See, when the, when the, when the women go and find the tomb, what do they do? The Bible, the Bible says that on the way to the tomb, they're all concerned. How in the world are we going to roll this tomb away? How in the world are we going to get that great big stone away from the door? Oh, they didn't know that already been solved for them. Amen? And now notice, the tomb, the door of the tomb was not rolled away so that Jesus Christ could get out. It was rolled away so that the women could get in. Amen? And so they walk in, and all of a sudden Mary's crying, Where have they taken the Lord? They moved his body. They stole his body in the night. And then all of a sudden, a guy comes up and says, Woman, why leave this out? And she thought he was the gardener, right? You know why? Because the gardener in those days wore long white linen robes. Some of y'all get that in a second. They go in and they see the shell. They see where the clothes where his body had been wrapped. And it's still perfectly wrapped. The only thing that had been moved was the napkin that covered his face. Here's something interesting. The Bible says that the napkin, it's very specific to mention the napkin. The napkin that was covering his face, what does the Bible say? The Bible says it was what? Folded and set aside. In those days, and even today, it is still customary if you're at a dinner table and you're trying to be proper, if you're done with your meal, you take the napkin, wad it up, and set it on the plate. But if you have to leave the table for a moment and you intend and you intend to come back, you fold the napkin and place it down in the seat. Hey, when Jesus Christ got up out of the tomb, he didn't walk that napkin up and throw it down. He folded it neatly because he said, I'm coming back. Amen. 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 Oh, yes. Amen. And so stay with me now. So Mary thinks he's the gardener. And she says, have you taken his body? Please tell us where you've taken his body. And he says, Mary, Mary. And she realizes who it is. She realizes, wait a second, this is Jesus. And he, she says, Rabboni. And she goes and she's going to hug him. And what is it? Now stay with me. You're almost done. You cannot miss this part. What does he say? He says, don't touch me yet. For I have not yet ascended to my Father, which is in heaven. Well, now, wait a second. Later on that night, what does he tell Thomas? He says, Thomas, come and put your hands in, your, in my side. Come and put your fingers in the holes. It's me. Yeah. But wait a second. He did not ascend back to heaven until 40 days after. Stay with me. Something happened be between that Sunday morning and that Sunday night. Something happened there where Jesus went to the Father. Because that Sunday morning, he said, don't touch me yet. And then that Sunday night, he said, all right, come on and touch me. You say, preacher, what happened? Well, I'm going to tell you, stay with me now. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, what did he shed? His blood, amen. We don't believe in salvation by the tub. We got a baptistry right here, but that's not what saves you. You can get baptized till the tadpoles know your social security number ain't going to do you no good. You can be dunked under the water a thousand times. We don't believe in salvation by the tub. We believe in salvation by the blood. Amen. Amen. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that paid for our sin. And in the Old Testament, when they would sacrifice lambs and goats, what they had to do is one time a year, that high priest had to take blood, and he had to take it in there, and he had to pour it on the mercy seat, on the altar. And that's what made the atonement for sin. Now, the Bible saw it calls Jesus Christ the high priest of our profession. Amen. The Bible says that he is now our high priest. Stay with me. I'm almost done a promise. And so Jesus Christ, what he has to do is he has to go and take his blood. It's not the blood of bulls and the goats. It's not the blood of calves. Uh, but it's his own blood. He has to take that blood and he has to go and put it on the altar or the mercy seat in heaven. Now, the Bible says that there are doors in heaven. In fact, you read Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation 19. The Bible says that the doors were open in heaven. Stay with me here. The Bible says that heaven has gates, right? Gate of pearl. So guess what? 
These eight, and stay with me now, for 33 and a half years, these angels have been looking out for Jesus. Isn't that what the Bible says? The Bible says he's given the angels charge over him. Listen, any time he dashes his foot against the stone, the angels have been watching over Jesus. And the angels have been making sure that Jesus was safe. And the Bible says the angels ministered to him. And for 33 and a half years, and then all of a sudden, the darling Son of God is laying there on the cross, or hanging there on the cross, and he's dying for the sin of the world. And they're looking over. And all of a sudden, wait, wait a second. He's risen from the dead. He came back from the dead. He marched in through the gates of death. And he marched in through the gates of hell. And he marched in through the gates of the earth. And now he's risen from the dead. Look at him. He's there on the earth. He's risen. Hallelujah. He's risen. Thank God. Hallelujah. Wait a second. What's going on? What, what, what's happening? Jesus Christ is now coming up through the universe and through the galaxies. And he's going probably about a million light miles or light years per second. He's going up and he's traveling up through the earth. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is standing on the outside of heaven. He's going through the doors of heaven, right? And he's standing there at the outside of the gates of heaven. And he's not coming by himself. He's coming with the blood that he shed on Calvary. Amen? And all the... Stay with me here. All of a sudden he looks out uh, and Jesus Christ looks up uh, and he's got the blood and he's ready to put that blood on the altar to make a full atonement for our sin. And he marches up and you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lift up your everlasting doors uh, and the King of glory shall come in. And he goes up to the Father and he kneels down and he sets that blood on the mercy seat uh, and now he can pay for the sin of the world. Now it is completely finished. Stay with me here. And one day, the Bible says he's coming back. Amen. He's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is going to split in two. He's going to ride through there at the Battle of Armageddon. He's going to kill all the enemies. And he's going to march in there on a wide Arabian. And the Bible says he's going to go in through the eastern gate. Right. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lift, lift you up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Yes. And he's going to go in there in Jerusalem. He's going to sit down on the throne of his father, David, and he's going to reclaim what's rightfully his. And if you're saved, you're going to be there. You're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And the Bible says of the increase of his government, there shall be no end, and he shall reign forever and ever and evermore. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord of Hosts. He is the King of Glory. And he's the King. He's always going to be the King. Amen. Nobody's ever going to challenge His crown. Nobody's ever going to challenge His throne. There's never going to be an overthrow of power. And it's all because 2,000 years ago He won the victory and we got it from the dead. Amen. Now, I'm done. Here's the application. You ready? You're here this morning, you're depressed, you're discouraged, you're downtrodden, the devil's been beating you up. Life's just been, I mean, just knocking you right in the nose. You know what I can say to you this morning? I can say that Satan's going to fight. All the devils in hell going to fight. This is everything going to come against you. Sometimes you're, you're going to feel like you're going crazy. Sometimes you're going to feel like nothing's ever going to get better. Sometimes you're going to feel like everything's just on a downward spiral and there's no way it's ever going to go up again. But I just want to hear, listen to me, I just want to give you some words out of uh, Psalms 24. Be ye lift up, ye gates. See, nobody could have ever thought that somebody would come through the gates of death and won. Nobody would have ever thought that somebody could have come through the gates of hell and won. Nobody could have ever thought that somebody could come into the gates of the earth and win. Nobody would have ever thought that Jesus Christ could enter into the gates of his blood. But here it is, and it's possible all because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Amen. Lift up your heads. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is risen to death. Amen. Amen. He's won the victory for us. And the Bible says because he got us out of the grave, if I die one day, I'm going to get us out of the grave. Right, right, right. Oh, yes. Now, if you're here this morning, listen, if you're here this morning, where's my wife at? Oh, there she is. Come back to the piano, babe. Look, I'm closing my Bible. I'm done. If you're here this morning and you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity... Maybe you say, preacher, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I don't know if I'm truly going to heaven. Your church membership can't get you there. Your baptism, your good works, 
coming to church. Nothing gets you into heaven except getting down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, no good sinner, and I need you to wash me in your blood and save me from hell. Yeah. Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me, and I believe you rose again from the dead, yeah. and that's what I'm trusting in to get me to heaven and nothing else. That's all it takes to get you into heaven, man. You ain't got to go through a process. You ain't got to jump through hoops. You ain't got to join this church. You ain't got to do nothing but put your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's it, man. And he'll save your soul, and you don't ever have to worry about going to hell ever again. Amen. But I'm glad I've got a Savior that marched through the gates and won the victory. Maybe you're saved here this morning, man. You the devil's just been fighting. You know what I can say to you? Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting door. Listen, lift up your heads. The king is coming in. And I believe the king's just kind of settled in here this morning. And he's wanting to work in your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Will there be anybody honest enough this morning to say, Preacher, I'm not, I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's going to try to say something to you. Nothing. I just want to pray for you. Will there be anybody here honest enough to say this morning, Preacher, if I were to die right now, I am not 100% sure I'm going to heaven. Preacher, would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand right up and right back down? Anybody like that? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to spend eternity. Thank you. I see those hands. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm going to spend eternity. I'm concerned about my soul. Anybody else? All right, let me ask you another question. Will there you be, just be honest. Now, just be honest with the Lord. Will there be anybody here this morning and say, Preacher... Boy, I tell you what, this Easter Sunday, leading up to this Sunday, just the devil's just been fighting. And it's been a rough month. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough year for my family. And preacher, I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes I feel like the victory's nowhere in sight. Would you raise your hand? That's me this morning, preacher. Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. Christians, why don't you lead the way? If you need to come and pray and talk to the Lord about anything, why don't you just come? No need to walk around defeated and discouraged. The King of Glory's walked in through the gates and he wants to walk into your life this morning and he wants you to be encouraged. Father, I pray for those now that raised their hand. Father, those that didn't, I pray that you would do a work now this Sunday morning as we gather to meet with you. I pray that you get people in the altar in Jesus' name, amen. My wife's going to begin to play. If you need to come this morning, why don't you come? If you raise your hand for any reason, the Christians lead the way. Maybe you need to pray for somebody. If you need to come, why don't you come this morning? Some have already come. Some are coming. If you need to come, just come on. Maybe you just ought to thank the Lord for raising you from the dead or from raising up from the dead so that you could have eternal life. If you need to talk to the Lord about anything, why don't you just come on?
All right. Well, how many glad you came to church this morning? Amen. Good Sunday in the Lord's house. All right. We'll remember, be back tonight at 5 o'clock. And we'll have our service at 5. Go enjoy family time and Easter dinner and all that, okay? Let's close out in a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Brother David, close us out if you will, please, sir. Father, we thank you for the good service and the good message this morning. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. We pray if there's one here that's uh, still lost, that they'll take these things to heart and know that you're the only way out of this thing, Lord. You're our Savior. And we thank you for that. Thank you for this good day. Bless these people in Jesus' name.